I'm Tanya, and this is Black Women Read, reviews the books, zines, and everything in between. When I first saw the promotional ads for Surviving R. Kelly a couple of months ago, I was surprised. Black women who have been concerned about the stories surrounding Kelly and young black girls have been calling for his exposure for literally decades. It seemed too good to be true. Was Kelly finally going to be held accountable for his actions? I have to admit, I was somewhat skeptical. Kelly has been able to thrive relatively well in the black community for the past 30 years. I wondered if the series would really bring it or just gloss over his documented transgressions. Luckily, I was proven wrong on the first episode. The docu-series, which aired on the Lifetime Network, was produced by Dream Hampton, a writer, cultural critic, and filmmaker. It's fitting that Hampton would be at the helm of this project. Hampton has been deeply immersed in the R&B, hip-hop, black celebrity world since the early 90s. She personally knows some of the most popular black celebrities of that time, so most likely has been privy to the behind-the-scenes behavior of R. Kelly. She was able to bring credibility to the series. Like Hampton, I'm a Gen Xer, so I grew up with R. Kelly. Kelly was on constant repeat on my disc player alongside other 90s R&B male singers like Tevin Campbell, Keith Sweat, Johnny Gill, and others. It was an amazing time in black music, and Kelly was at the forefront of it all. The first concert I ever went to when I was a teenager was R. Kelly. I'll never forget the music of singer Aaliyah being played before his set. I remember my friend and I got excited because we thought Aaliyah was going to come out and perform. We would be horrified to eventually learn that Kelly had married then 15-year-old Aaliyah and had possibly impregnated her. The marriage was quickly annulled. We thought, like everyone else, Kelly was a brilliant producer that was just being a mentor to Aaliyah and helping her with her music career, not being intimate with her. I started to look at Kelly with new eyes. After that incident, an avalanche of stories came out regarding Kelly and young black girls. He was known to cruise Chicago middle schools and high schools to pick up young girls. Then the tape appeared of him urinating on a young black girl. At that point, I was over him. It wasn't that hard for me to kick him to the curb. There were tons of other black R&B male singers to pick from at the time. And really, one can argue, Kelly is nothing but a poor man's Charlie Wilson anyway. However, It seemed much harder for other black people, especially black women, to let Kelly go. The black girls who accused R. Kelly of sexual misconduct were degraded, bashed, and mocked. It blew my mind. The fact that so many black people were willing to defend Kelly simply because he could sing, it was upsetting and frankly embarrassing. So, the documentary was retribution for the victims of Kelly but it also highlighted an alarming problem within the black community. Too many people willing to be complicit to exploit young black girls for access to fame, money, and material items. The fact that so many parents had no qualms handing their children over to Kelly despite knowing his reputation is team staff participating in luring young girls for Kelly's pleasure and even his spouse at the time pretending not to know is an outrage. It is deeply troubling none of the confessors in the documentary took accountability for their actions. Their apologies and tears rang hollow and fake and more on the level of clearing their conscience for themselves in fear of getting in trouble, which actually they should all be brought up on charges. Stephanie Hargrove, a PhD candidate who specializes in intimate partner violence in community-based learning and culturally competent care for black women, wrote the article, was hidden in plain sight, a look at child sexual abuse. 
she discussed the alarming rates of sexual abuse of black girls. 60% of black girls experience sexual assault by the time they reach age 18 and why it's been difficult to tackle the issue of child sex abuse in the black community. She writes, childhood sexual abuse is a topic that desperately needs attention in the African American community, yet not enough people talk about it above a whisper. While child sexual abuse and the secrecy around it is a universal problem, I want to focus on the trend of silence I have noticed around this issue in the black community based on my time as a victim advocate and mentor. It is understandable to not want to peek behind the curtain of ignorance and bear witness to the dreadful acts that are hidden in plain sight. But as much as we do not want to delve into these difficult subjects, there are countless children who have experienced this type of abuse firsthand. While many detractors of the surviving R. Kelly series have eagerly pointed out that white folks do it too, no shit, we know that. Hargrove emphasizes child sexual abuse is certainly not unique to the African American community. It is a widespread issue that can be found in every racial and ethnic group. But as I think about the people that I have encountered and the heartbreaking stories that they have shared, it is still baffling to me that this is an issue that African Americans are reluctant to discuss and or aggressively address. However, how we've been addressing this problem, or really lack of addressing this problem, is where the black community falters. Hargrove goes on to state, when we look at the black community, the prevalence of children being sexually abused is somewhat of a conundrum because we have attributes of a collectivist culture. Collectivists sacrifice the interests of the individual for what is in the best interest of the group because the group, family, tribe, or state is the principal element of reality. In collectivist culture, people are considered good if they are generous, helpful, dependable, and attentive to the needs of others. This contrasts with individualistic cultures, which often place a greater emphasis on characteristics such as assertiveness and independence. Many African Americans believe in the African proverb that it exemplifies our collective culture. It takes a village to raise a child. So I would think that the same village would serve to protect children and hold perpetrators responsible for their crimes. We know that communities of color tend to work together for the greater good of the community. And yet, there are these trends of sexual violence against children that are not being addressed. The reason the black community seems to be plagued with this issue, despite our collectivist culture, is unclear. I believe it is most likely related to a convoluted web of systematic oppression, intergener intergenerational transmission of abuse, and personal culpability. Hargrove concludes with best ways to defend against child sexual abuse, particularly downplaying the narrative of stranger danger, that the reality that children are more likely to be preyed upon and violated by people they know. She also pushed for the black community to really live up to the mantra of it takes a village to raise a child, believing black girls children when they are brave enough to tell their stories and holding sexual abusers accountable. She writes, in terms of openness, as true in the larger society, the black community as a whole needs to be aware that there are people with malintent towards children in our community as well. It is difficult to think about and hard to imagine, but the fact is they are out there. So if children report abuse, believe them, support them, and allow them to get help. Furthermore, those who the child may disclose to need to provide a caring and non-judgmental approach when handling the situation. The reaction of the first person the child tells about the abuse can determine the trajectory of that child's healing process. If it is a negative response, they may never tell anyone or reach out for help again. Unfortunately, I believe this is what may have happened with the black girls and young women that I have encountered. 
<sighs> Honestly, I struggled to make this video. The surviving R. Kelly documentary was hard to watch. It was triggering, angering, and depressing. The responses from the black community of the series has left me feeling worried. The still defense of Kelly, whose heyday has long come and gone, he's pretty much washed up. It seems it would be easy enough to put him out the pasture at this point. So it's mind numbing that it hasn't happened. I truly don't get it. It's left me feeling concerned for our black girls and children. The black community say they love their children, that they are our future, but I don't know. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at the next video.